Welcome back, I'm Robert Breaker, and today I've got a message for you about assurance, assurance of salvation. I wanted to preach on this for some time. I've had this on my list of things to preach on probably for several years. And uh, this is something that I've just never gotten to yet until now. And I'm preaching this, I believe, in a timely manner. I believe this is something that needs to be given and needs to be preached on, needs to be spoken about. Um, I believe that we are in the last days. I've said that many times, and I'm not the only one. Uh, people contact me all the time and say, Brother Breaker, I really do think that we're in the last days. And so we are almost right here. We are right here, almost to the time of the rapture. And as I preach this, we are in May of 2018. And Israel has just finished celebrating their 70th anniversary of when they started themselves as a nation on May 14th. So I think that's exciting. I think that's exciting. And I'm looking up. Amen. But the Bible says that in this time period, right before the rapture, it'll be a time of apostasy. Apostasy means a falling away. And I am seeing it, and many, many other people are seeing it. There are so many today that claim to be Christians that are falling away from the true doctrine of salvation. They have changed what they used to preach. And they are teaching a bloodless gospel instead of the true blood-stained gospel of salvation. And so I believe that it's so important. I was thinking, what if? What if this is my last message? <laughs> what if Jesus is coming and uh, this will be the last message? Well, I thought, well, I want to be, be faithful in preaching the gospel and salvation by faith so that someone could get saved and go at the rapture and not be left behind. Now, I'm not setting a date of the rapture. I don't know when it will be, but I do believe it's soon. And because of that, I have more of a desire to want to see people saved so they'll go with the rapture. But I'm finding more and more and more and more and more people that are instead of preaching the gospel and teaching the word of truth, they're deceiving people. I get email after email after email of people saying, Brother Breaker, why aren't they preaching the blood anymore? Brother Breaker, why aren't they preaching the gospel anymore correctly as the Bible says it? Brother Breaker, what's the problem? Why are so many falling away? And this all ties in with salvation. Uh, over the years, and even in the last year or so, I've gotten so many emails from people that say, Brother Breaker, I used to watch this guy on YouTube, and I do not watch him anymore. Because he had a Lordship Salvation message. He was telling us that salvation was by what we did, or didn't do, and uh, it works, basically. And, and they said we were deceived, and we always doubted if we were saved or not. And many of those same people have emailed and said, Brother Breaker, I watched some of your videos and you give the gospel so plainly. We've gotten saved by watching your videos. And you know what they all tell me? They all say, and I've never doubted ever since whether I was saved or not. Well, we watched this fellow, we always doubted. And now that we've seen the true gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, that we've seen salvation is through faith in the blood, Romans 3, 25, why well, we've never doubted. So I think that's a blessing and that's what salvation is all about. Salvation is getting saved and knowing you're saved. It's all about having assurance that you're saved or not. Now, I'm not going to take all the credit for this message. My dad passed away in 2010, and before that, several years before, he wrote a little gospel tract entitled, Blessed Assurance. And I took that little tract that he wrote, and I went through and, and changed a little bit and made it my own tract. And so I hand this out to people sometimes. It's called Blessed Assurance. And what my dad did was he looked up the word assurance in the King James Bible. And you know what he found? He found that the word assurance appears seven times in the King James Bible. So assurance shows up seven times. Now you know what seven is. Why seven is the number of perfection. God always seems to use that number seven over and over and over. And I find it's quite interesting that the term assurance is used seven times. So what I want to do today, I want to take you to the scriptures. We're going to look at what the Bible says. I'm going to show you these seven verses, and I'm going to write them up here on assurance. So we'll know what assurance is. And I want you to search your heart and see if you know for sure if you're saved or not. You see, if you don't know if you're saved or not, and you're, you're always, well, I don't know if I've got salvation. You know, I doubt it all the time. I worry about it. I wonder then let's get it right today. Let's get it right today where you know that you're saved. So let's go to Romans chapter 14. And I want to read Romans 14, 22 and 23. 
Romans chapter 14, verse 22 says, Hast thou faith? You see, that's what it all boils down to. Uh, faith is what saves. We're saved by faith. So the question is, do you have faith? If you don't, then that's probably why you don't have assurance of salvation. That's most likely the reason why you worry about whether you're saved or not. It's because you're lacking faith in something. It says, Hast thou faith? Have it, thy, have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in the thing which he hath allowed. <laughs> it's a, bl a blessing when we don't condemn ourselves, but when we see Christ and we see the gospel, and we say, wow, he's forgiven me. I have no doubt that I'm saved because he's the one that saves me. You see, the problem with people that doubt their salvation, oftentimes they're trusting in what they do rather than what Jesus did. And when we trust in what we did... No wonder we doubt, because we always say, well, I wonder if I did enough. <laughs> so you'll always wonder if you did enough, if you think that that's what gets you to heaven, something you do. But when we see Christ as our Savior, trusting in His finished work for us, how can we doubt that? To doubt that is to doubt that Jesus died in, the pl in our place for our sin. I don't doubt that. I know He did. I believe He did. I know I'm saved because He did it for me, and I've trusted. I've believed. I've faith in what he's done. My faith is in him and what he's done for me on the cross, his precious shed blood, the gospel of what Jesus did. Now, look at verse 23. And he that doubteth is damned. Isn't that what people do that don't have assurance of salvation? They doubt. I've I talked to people before and they say, well, Brother Breaker, I, I don't know if I'm saved or not. I, I doubt it all the time and I always have this doubt and I always think, well, am I saved? Am I not? Am I saved? Am I? And they doubt it. Doubt is the opposite of faith. So I always ask them, so what's your faith then? You see, if you're saved, you're trusting in something, and you don't doubt it. You have assurance because you're trusting in what God said to trust in to be saved. And almost every single time someone says they have doubt, it's always because their faith was not in what God said for it to be. And that's why they doubt. It says here in verse 23, And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. God demands faith. Hebrews 11, 6 says, without faith it is impossible to please him. God will ask one thing of all men, faith, believe, trust in what? What he did for them on the cross, the shedding of his blood, trust that blood for the forgiveness of sins. So the reason that many people doubt if they're saved or not, it's because they're not trusting in that. Many times they're trusting in what they do rather than what Jesus did for them. Let's go to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 13. So I'm not coming today to try to talk you out of your salvation if you are truly saved. I am coming to you to ask, do you have assurance? Do you know for sure you're saved? 2 Corinthians 13, 5, look at what it says. The Apostle Paul tells us, Examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. It says, Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates? What's a reprobate? A lost person. So look at yourself. Examine yourself. Ask yourself this question. Am I in the faith? Am I trusting in what Jesus said? Now, when you preach a message like this, automatically these, these so-called Christians that, that uh, are liberal, that don't follow the scriptures, that have the newfangled gospel, the, the bloodless gospel, they come out of the woodwork and they say, Oh, all you're trying to do is talk people out of their salvation. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. And these same people, they say, No, a Christian can doubt. And I've even heard them say things like, It's healthy for a person to doubt their salvation. Why, why if you're saved, you ought to doubt it. That proves you're saved. And I'm thinking to myself, how could someone make such an idiotic statement? Doubt is the opposite of faith. So the fact that you have doubt proves that you're saved? <laughs> that makes no sense to me. No. You need to come to God for salvation. And when you're saved, He gives you assurance. So if you have no assurance and you're doubting your salvation, then most likely it's because you're lost. Now, I didn't say it was. I said it's most likely. Now, it could be that a Christian doubts if they're saved or not because they got into some sin, and because of that, they start to doubt. And I'm going to tell you what the remedy for that is today. But, I've heard people say, if you doubt your salvation, why, it's just the devil trying to make you doubt. And I listen to that, and I look at that, and I go, no, no. 
maybe, possibly, that could be that the devil tries to attack a Christian and makes him doubt if he's saved or not. But what if a person is not saved and the Holy Spirit of God is the one that's trying to make them doubt they're saved so that they will get saved? And he's trying to knock on their heart's door and say, Hey, you're a self-righteous Pharisee and you're lost and you think you're a Christian, but you don't have faith in what I said to put your faith in. And so it's the Holy Spirit convicting them. And that's why they doubt. Oh no, they never think that. <laughs> but I find many times that's who it is that makes a person doubt if they're saved or not. It's the Holy Spirit knocking on their door saying, Hey, hey, come on over to my side, the side of faith. Because doubt is the opposite of faith. So if you doubt your salvation, you've got problems. And I want to say that, and I will not say dogmatically 100%, it's because you're lost. You can, can be a Christian and have some doubt at times, but those will quickly be absolved as you read the Scriptures. The more you read the Bible, the less doubt you'll have. But let me say this. If you claim to be a Christian and you doubt whether you're saved and you don't know if you're saved or not, then most likely it's because you are lost. And that's what you need. You need assurance of salvation. Now, I want to give you assurance from the Scriptures. I'm going to take you through the seven different verses in the Bible about assurance. But before I do, let me explain something to you. Salvation is by faith. It's by believing. It's by trusting. We're going to get into this in this sermon after I give you these seven different places. But I want you to know something. I've seen some things in my life that just that make me cringe, that are just so sad. There are people out there today that are telling people a false gospel of salvation. Rather than pointing them to Christ crucified and telling them, trust what Jesus did for you, they tell people that salvation is, well, you just do this. And oftentimes it's the one, two, three, pray after me. Oftentimes it's the sinner's prayer thing. And they go to a sinner and they say, well, if you want to be saved, just ask God to save you. Just say, oh God, please save me. And they say, say this prayer. And then they give you a prayer to repeat. And then they, the man, tries to assure you that you're saved because you prayed. And so they say the assurance is, you be assured you're saved because I said so. I wish I could find a book that I found years ago by a guy named Doug Shorn entitled Zeal Without Knowledge. And he goes into this. He used to have a big, gigantic church, seven, eight, nine hundred people. And Every year he'd have seven or 800 baptisms and he'd always have so many people out soul winning and they'd always say, oh, we had 800 people soul win saved in soul winning this year and all this stuff. And then one day he woke up and he realized this is all based on a lie. All we're doing is trying to get people to repeat a prayer. And we're claiming all these people got saved. He says, but the church hasn't even grown. We're going out and baptizing all these people, but the church isn't growing. We're doing something wrong. And he started to look into what they were doing wrong. And he goes, we're doing it all in our own flesh, of ourselves, bragging on ourselves, and we're not pointing sinners to Christ. And so he realized the right gospel is to preach the blood for salvation and tell people how to be saved. Because what they were doing is we're just going out and saying, hey, you want to get saved? Repeat after me. And they were getting people to repeat a prayer after them. But those people weren't getting saved. And I've seen this, and this really bothers me. This really bothers me. Many of your churches, they tell people, if you'll just repeat this prayer, you'll be saved. And they say that the prayer saves. <laughs> now, I am not against prayer. I believe a person can get saved when they pray. But it's not the prayer itself that's the saving medium. You are not saved by a prayer. You are saved by faith. The Bible is very clear in teaching that. But I've heard people say, well, repeat this prayer after me, and a person does that. And then later they go, well, I don't know if I'm saved or not. And the preacher says, well, just say the prayer all over again and pray a prayer of assurance. That's the term they call it. And you say in the prayer, oh, God, I'm a sinner. Please save me. Amen. And you say, oh, right, I'm saved. And he says, yep, you're saved because I say so. And the person goes away and they go, wow, I'm saved. And then they start thinking about it. Am I saved? I mean, he says I am, but I don't feel saved. I don't. I don't know if I'm saved or not. And so he goes back to the preacher, and the preacher says, Oh, well, just pray the prayer of assurance again. And so he prays, Oh, God, please save me all over again. And he says, But I don't feel saved. I don't know if I'm saved. And what's the problem? The problem is the person has no assurance of salvation. And the reason is they think they're saved by the prayer. And that's why they're trusting in the prayer rather than in the propitiation. I've written a book years ago 
called The Heresy of the Sinner's Prayer. And uh, I just ordered myself a copy. <laughs> I have this on the website for sale. And it, I talk about in this how oftentimes people get into this mindset of being taught, hey, just repeat a sinner's prayer and you go to heaven, that they actually think that the prayer is what saves them. And so whenever they say the prayer and then they don't have any assurance of salvation, they say, well, what do I do? And the person says, well, just say the prayer all over again. And then you can be assured that you're saved. Pray the prayer of assurance. And so they say that salvation is the prayer, and when you don't have assurance, then do it again. And then do it again. Here's what happens. It happened to me. It happened to my wife. It happened to my dad. You get down by your bed every night and pray the prayer over and over. Oh, God, please save me. Oh, God, please save me. From the age 13 to age 18, every single night of my life before I went to bed, I had no assurance of salvation. I did not know if I was saved. I hoped I was saved. And I'd go to bed every night crying out to God, Oh, God, please save me and don't let me wake up in hell by not waking up from my sleep. My thought was the prayer saved. So I kept saying the prayer over and over and over, hoping that the prayer would save me. And I had no assurance of salvation. So it's for these people that I want to present this message because I'm sure there's many people out there just like I was. And the answer is not a prayer. It is not the prayer that saves you. Now you can pray, but the prayer itself isn't what saves. It's what Jesus did. And it's through faith or trusting in what Jesus did for you that saves. And then when you believe in that, that's when you have assurance. I've given my testimony before on YouTube. I've told how before um, I was told, just repeat this prayer. And I always thought, well, the prayer saves me. So I'd have to do it over and over and over. It wasn't until my dad sat me down and showed me the gospel. Then I believed in the gospel. I trusted the gospel. That's when I understood and believed. And that's when I got saved. And I can honestly say, honestly, from July 29th, 1992, when I first heard the gospel and understood and believed the blood of Christ for salvation, and I trusted the blood of Christ, I have never doubted whether I was saved or not. How many years ago was that? This is 2018. That was 1992. What is that, 20-some years ago? However long ago that was, I have not doubted once whether I was saved or not. I am assured that I have a place in heaven because of what Jesus did for me, and I trust what he did. I'm not trusting in what I do. My wife, the other day, I was talking to my wife, and she goes, Honey, I just want to tell you something. I go, What's that, baby? She goes, Since I got saved in 2006, she goes, I've never doubted if I was saved or not. She said, Before that, I doubted all the time. She says, But I've not doubted once. I said, Amen, honey. Isn't it a blessing that when you're truly saved by trusting in what God said to trust in, how you never doubt it? But when you're a false convert, then you always doubt, perpetual doubt. That's what the sinner's prayer heresy does. You see, the sinner's prayer teaching is a teaching that the prayer saves, so say the prayer to be saved. But what if you say the prayer with your mouth, but you don't believe from the heart? What if you ask God to save you with your mouth, but you don't trust God to save you? Do you see the problem? See, a false convert is someone that said something and asked for forgiveness and repeated a prayer, but they've never, by faith, trusted in the finished work of Christ. That's why they doubt. Because they're trusting in what they did rather than what Jesus did for them. So that's what it all boils down to. Salvation is by trusting in what Jesus did. It's not what we do. You see, lost people, they trust in what they do or say. And many times they say, Oh, I'm saved by the prayer, so if I just say the prayer, well, I'm... And so they repeat the prayer over and over. And look, I'm not against a prayer. I am not against prayer. You can pray when you want to. But the prayer doesn't save you. Can't you see that? And most of your so-called modern-day Christianity today tells you, no, if you want to be saved, say the prayer. It's the prayer that saves. Say the sinner's prayer. And, and many people do that without faith in the blood. And that's why they're still lost, because they have no faith in what Jesus did. They're trusting in what they did or what they said. It's amazing to me how so many people still don't get that. But when you do, when you see that, when you understand that and you realize that, 
and then you say, oh, I've been lost all these years trusting in what I did. I give up all what I've done, and I trust solely on what Jesus did. I trust the blood. That's when you get saved. So it's all about that blood of Jesus. Are you trusting in the blood atonement of Christ? If so, you'll have assurance. If not, you won't. All right, so let's get started here. Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 66. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the seven places in the Bible that talk about assurance. Deuteronomy 26, 66 will be the first. Deuteronomy 28, excuse me, I said 26. 28, 66. What does Deuteronomy 28, 66 say? And I want you to see what the Bible itself says about assurance. Because I think it's so revealing, it's so amazing, so interesting, because when you go by what God says, then you'll have assurance. I want you to have assurance based upon what God says, not Robert Breaker. I don't ever want to hear someone say, I'm saved because Robert Breaker said so. <laughs> no, no. I want people to say, I'm saved because the Bible says so, and I'm trusting in the very thing that God said to believe in for me to be saved. It's all about what God said. So the first time the word assurance appears in the Bible is in Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 66. And it says, And thy life shall hang in doubt before thee, and thou shalt fear day and night, and thou shalt have none assurance of thy life. You know, again, there are some people in this life that say they're Christians, but they doubt if they're saved day and night. They have a fear. I don't know if I'm saved or not. Usually it's because they've got the false gospel. It's not because they're trusting in the true gospel, the blood-stained gospel of trust what Jesus did. But notice what it says here. You have none assurance of thy life. According to the Bible, there's no assurance of life. That means we're all going to die someday. The Bible says it is pointed on a man once to die and after that the judgment. Except, except for those that go with the rapture. <laughs> Praise God for that. That's what we're waiting for. That's the... A uh, thing that's an exception, that's an amazing thing that we can go without dying. But the Bible says, be assured that someday you're going to die if Jesus doesn't come soon. And throughout the history of the world, people have died. And that's one of the scariest things in the world for people, is not knowing where they go when they die. As I preach this message, if I were to look at you and ask you a question, how would you answer that question? What if I were to ask you, if you were to die right now, where would you go? Heaven or hell? Why? How would you answer that? Some people say, well, I don't, I don't want to think about it. It scares me too much. Because if hell's real, then I'd, I'd go to hell and I don't want to think about it. Well, I don't know what to tell you except be assured that you're going to die. There's no way to live forever in this life. But you can live forever with Jesus in the afterlife. It's all up to you. Be assured that you will die. The Bible says in Romans 5.12, Wherefore, as by one man sin had entered, entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. Because of sin, we all die. Are you a sinner? I'm looking for a few good sinners so they can get saved. You know, the first thing you have to understand before you can get saved is that you're lost, that you're a sinner. You see, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. If you're not a sinner, well, I guess you can't get saved. Well, I've met people that told me, well, I'm not a sinner, I've never sinned, and I just laugh. No, the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. No, you're a sinner, and you need to be saved. And if you're not, be assured you will die someday and go to hell. 1 Corinthians 15, 22 says, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. You see, we all come from our father Adam, and we're all going to die someday unless we come to Christ. And then... He will give us eternal life. So the first thing I want to say is assurance. The Bible, first time the Bible gives the word assurance, it tells men, be assured that death is going to come on everyone. Everyone will die. I want to assure you of that, God says in the scriptures. Isaiah 32, 17 is our next verse, and I'm going to go in, in, in order. Isaiah 32, 17. Now this verse is amazing. Isaiah 32, 17 is an Old Testament, I believe, I'm going to call this a prophecy of New Testament salvation. I think when Isaiah wrote this, he didn't understand what he was writing exactly. Many things that he wrote, like Isaiah 53, were future events of Christ on the cross. And I think Isaiah is writing in Isaiah chapter 32 and verse 17 about 
salvation for us today in a prophetic way. Because he says in Isaiah 32, 17, And the work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness quietus, quietness and assurance, notice what it says, forever. When we're saved, the Bible says we're saved, and we have peace through the blood of his cross today. This is salvation for today. And this verse says the work of righteousness. What does Jesus do? He was the righteous, the just, who died for the unjust. And when we come to Jesus and we trust His righteousness, guess what? We get saved. And we have peace with God through the blood of the cross, it says in the book of Romans. And, and, and he's saying here in Isaiah, Isaiah is saying about the church age and about church age salvation, and the work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. When you're saved, you know that you're saved. And you know you're saved forever. So if you're saved, you shouldn't doubt it. If you're truly saved. That's why I say, if you continually doubt if you're saved or not, then you're probably like one of these guys who's not saved. You're trusting in what you do rather than what Jesus did. So the work of righteousness is peace, quietness, and assurance forever. Like I told you, and I'm not lying. I told you earlier, and I'll tell you again. I have never doubted whether I was saved or not after I got saved on July 29, 1992. Never doubted. Why? Because before I lived in doubt thinking, oh, I've got to do this, I've got to do this, it's all what I do. And I always wondered, did I do enough? But when I realized, it's not what I do. It's what Christ has done for me and I trust in what He's done. I had peace and assurance forever. How about you? In uh, Romans chapter 5, Verse 17 talks about this, and in Romans 5, 17 says, For if by one man, one man's offense, death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. When we're saved, we get the gift of God's righteousness. Verse 18, Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Now look at verse 21. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. We have assurance forever when we're saved today. And what God's given us is His righteousness as a free gift. I'm saved and God has imputed His righteousness to me. How did I get that imputed to me? By faith. Romans chapter 10, we're in Romans 10. Romans 10, 4, what does it say? For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. You see, under the Old Testament law, it was all about you and your righteousness. You living right, you doing right. It was all what you did. And you never had assurance of salvation under that law. Never. You always wondered and hoped, I hope I did enough for God to accept me. Thank God we don't live under that today, where we have to live in continual doubt and worry. Thank God that in the New Testament, in the church age, salvation is by grace. Salvation is by faith, believing. And when we believe or trust, we put our faith in the finished work of Christ, while we have peace and assurance forever. What a blessing. What a blessing. So that's the second time. Let's, one more verse. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 5.21. 2 Corinthians 5.21. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. Who's that? God the Father made Jesus Christ, God the Son, to be sin for us who knew no sin. Jesus never sinned. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. When our faith is in what Jesus did, when we trust the blood atonement, why guess what? God gives us his righteousness. And in God's eyes, we are fully forgiven, and we are clean, and we are righteous in His sight. The third time the word assurance shows up is Acts 17, 31. Acts chapter 17 and verse 31. Here is the Apostle Paul speaking to a bunch of lost people. Actually, I guess I could call them what they were, lost religious people. And further, I'll call them even more what they were. They were lost pagan 
religious people who worship false gods. Now notice what he says in Acts 17.31. Acts chapter 17 and verse 31, the Apostle Paul says, Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. Who's this? God the Father. He's talking about Jesus, God the Son, whom God the Father hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. I find two things in this passage of scriptures. Be assured that God will judge you someday. And be assured that Jesus rose from the dead. Do you see that there? God will judge all men someday. And be assured that Jesus has risen from the dead. If you were to go to Jerusalem now, and I've never been there, I really honestly don't have any desire to be there because it's all sandy, sandy, dusty place. Um, I'm reading now um, Samuel Clemens or Mark Twain's uh, I guess you'd call it more of a diary of when he went to Jerusalem, and I'm following his steps as he's writing about what he saw when he went to Jerusalem in the 18, was it 1860s or something like that. It's called Innocence Abroad, if you want to get the book. It's quite interesting of his trip to Israel. And it doesn't sound like the kind of place I want to go. I, I, I will uh, be happy just reading about it through what he wrote. But you go to Acts chapter 2, look at what it says. If you go over to Jerusalem you will find the tomb of Jesus Christ. And you know what you won't find? The bones. Because Jesus rose again. I think that's interesting. And it says in Acts chapter 2, in verse 23 and 24, Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God have ye taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. He's talking about Jesus of Nazareth, verse 22. Verse 24, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. You go to Jerusalem today, you look at the tomb of Christ, and it's empty. He's not there because he's risen. Be assured of that fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Everybody in the world ought to know that. But yet many people in the world, they deny Christ. What a sad thing. Now let's go to Colossians chapter 2 and verse 2. And here's one of two verses in which we have a word used in front of the word assurance that I think is wonderful. We find this in, in the seventh one as well. And this is the term full assurance. I, I think it's so neat that it says full assurance. Full assurance of what? Let's look at this verse. Colossians 2, 2. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 2, what does the Bible say? I, I'm just going through and showing you every time the Bible uses the word assurance. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 2. That their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and into all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. You know, the Trinity, God. God, the Holy Spirit, God the Father, the Christ, the Son. And it says here, the full assurance of understanding. See, salvation, there's some understanding involved. And the reason that there's so many people today that claim to be Christians and they doubt their salvation is because they're misunderstanding something. They're not understanding what the Bible teaches. They have a false understanding of salvation. That's why they're trusting in something they did rather than what Christ did for them. So, this is the full understanding. Look at Acts chapter 28. I'm going to show another verse here later, but this is a verse that Jesus spoke that the Apostle Paul uh, quotes. Acts chapter 28, verse 26 and 27. Acts 28, 26 and 27. saying, Go unto this people and say, Hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and not perceive. For the heart of this people is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. There's understanding that comes along with salvation. There's some things that you need to understand before you can be saved. 
And what happens all too often in modern Christianity, in their zeal to go win souls, many people will run out and say, I want so bad to win somebody to Jesus, so I'm going to go to them with the Romans road, one, two, three, pray after me. And they don't care if the person understands anything about the gospel. They just want them to say that prayer. And you know, maybe their heart's in the right place. Maybe they, they really do want to win souls. But they're not thinking. What if the person says the prayer without understanding the gospel and without trusting in the blood atonement or what Jesus did or the gospel? Then that person is thinking they're saved because of the prayer. And so when they have no assurance, they say, well, I'm just going to say the prayer again. And so they say the prayer over and 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 over. And they never know if they're saved. Why don't they know? Because they don't have the understanding. What does the Bible say? Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom after, also after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of His glory. 15. Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ and the Father of glory, the Father of glory, amen, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. Verse 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling, what is the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. You've got to have the eyes of your understanding enlightened. You've got to understand something in order to be saved. What do you need to understand? Well, that takes us to the next one. 1 Thessalonians 1.5. 1 Thessalonians 1.5. Here's the fifth time we come across the word assurance in the Bible. 1 Thessalonians 1.5. The Apostle Paul again and notice what he says in 1 Thessalonians 1.5. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power, and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance. As you know, what manner of men we were among you for your sake. So look what he says here. We came to you with the gospel, and with power, and with the Holy Ghost, and we came with much assurance. What was it that gave the assurance the gospel? What is the gospel? The gospel is 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. That's the gospel. The gospel is how that Christ died for our sins. How did he do it? Through a blood atonement. That he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. It was all for our sins. And it says, by which ye are saved. How? By believing. By believing the gospel you're saved. Alright, so what happens when you go to somebody who's lost and you tell that person, hey man, you want to get saved? And they say, yeah, yeah, I don't want to get hell. And you say, well, you're a sinner and, and uh, because you're a sinner, well, you need Jesus. So come to Jesus and repeat this prayer. Oh Jesus, I'm a sinner, please save me. Amen. And a person does that, but you didn't even give them the gospel. How can they understand the gospel and place their faith in the gospel if you haven't even presented the gospel? I've told you this before, and I'll tell you again. I've been to over 200 churches preaching in my lifetime. And one of the things I like to do is when I'm in a church, the uh, first thing I like to do is say, hey, how many here can tell me what the gospel is? Because the Bible tells us we're supposed to preach the gospel to the lost world. So who here can tell me where it is in the Bible? Only about 10 times has anyone ever said the right answer. I was aghast. I was, I was surprised, and I was saddened. How few people that claim to be Christians today even know what the gospel is. Some people answered, well, it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I said, no, those are called gospels because they talk about the good news of Christ. But I'm asking, where in the scripture does it say this is the gospel? Most of the churches I've preached in, and they were King James Bible-believing only churches, even knew what the gospel was. How can we preach to the lost and dying world the gospel if we don't even know where it is in the Bible? How do we win souls to Christ without the gospel? It's the gospel that saves. And he says here, the Apostle Paul said he went with the gospel in the Holy Ghost and in power and in much assurance. And he came unto them with the true gospel of salvation. 
And you know what they had? They had much assurance. The early church knew they were saved. You don't find one account of Scripture anywhere in the Bible of the early church saying, and then we doubted if we were saved or not. No, the contrary is true. Why, you read Paul saying, I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. I know that I'm saved, and I have assurance. The early church had much assurance. How about you? Well, if you're trusting the gospel, then you're assured. You have assurance. The gospel is the gospel of assurance. Because the gospel is Jesus Christ is God who died for you. He doesn't mess things up. God never makes mistakes. So if He paid for your sins and you're saved by what He did, and you trust that, then you can rely on that because God cannot lie, the Bible says. And He said you trust Him and His blood atonement. You trust the gospel, the blood He shed, then you're saved. God can't lie. I'm assured of my salvation because I trust that. Now, Hebrews 6.11, look at this. Here we find again the term full assurance. I like that term, full assurance. And you know what's so funny and sad at the same time? What we're assured of in this verse is the very thing that so many today are attacking. He's talking about the rapture. Look at what it says here in Hebrews 6.11. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. The full assurance of hope. Here's an assurance, of full assurance of hope. All right, I look at Paul's other epistles and I say, what does Paul call his hope? And then I say, oh yeah, that's right. That's right. Titus 2.13. The blessed hope. The blessed hope. Yet today, all over YouTube... It's so disgusting to me. There's so many people making videos saying the rapture is a lie. There's no such thing as the rapture. There'll be no rapture. Other people say there's no pre-tribulation rapture. There's just a mid-trib rapture or a post-trib rapture. And all these people are attacking the rapture. And yet we're supposed to have full assurance of the hope that Jesus Christ is coming back for us to rapture us out. Why are they trying to steal our assurance? I'm fully assured that Jesus is coming again. I am fully assured that Jesus is coming back for me at the rapture. We're told in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18 about it and how we're to comfort one another with those words. So the blessed hope is the rapture. And I'm fully assured that Jesus is coming back. Now, the last one here is Hebrews 10, 22. And I hope this has been a, a Bible study that's a blessing to you. I just like to go to the Bible itself. I'm a King James Bible believer, so it's not what I say, it's what the Bible says. So let's look at the Scriptures. Hebrews 10, 22, we find the term full assurance again. Uh, I think I said it earlier that twice does it say full assurance. Well, I, I was wrong there. It was three times the Bible says full assurance. Somehow I'll try to highlight that a little bit differently. Because three times the Bible talks about full assurance. Full assurance of understanding. Full assurance of hope. Now look at this one. Full assurance of what? Let's go to Hebrews 10.22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Verse 23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. You see, salvation is by faith. We can be fully assured that if our faith is in the finished work of Christ, then we're saved. I trust the blood. And notice what it says there, from the heart. So faith from the heart. And faith in what? the blood atonement of Christ. So when you're saved, you're saved by faith. And when you have faith in what God said to place your faith in, the blood atonement of Christ, the gospel, then you have full assurance that you're saved. Again, every single time that I've dealt with a person that says, I don't know if I'm saved or not, it all boiled to down to the fact of whether or not they were trusting in the blood of Christ. And they doubted because their faith was not in the finished work of Christ. Their faith was always in something else. 
well, I, I go to church, so I must be saved. I'm a good person. Well, I don't sin. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't chew. I don't run. The, I do this. I do that. Uh, I said the prayer. I, and they were always trusting in something they did. They were not trusting in what Jesus did for them. They had no full assurance of salvation because their faith was not in what God said their faith should be in. So let's look at this. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. It's baffling to me. Baffling to me. I've been watching um, YouTube little by little, and I don't have time to watch YouTube videos, so I've been watching this thing between four or five different people on YouTube going back and forth. And I don't even watch their videos. I've, I've been watching it in the sense that people have been emailing me and saying, Brother Breaker, this guy said this. Brother Breaker, this guy said that. And so they're telling me this fight that's going on on YouTube between people that claim to be Bible believers, claim to be Christians. And they say there's this man that's been on YouTube for many years who claims he's a King James Bible believer and teacher. And yet he's turned against the doctrine of faith for salvation. He's preached videos against salvation by faith. He's began teaching a bloodless gospel. He tells people if you want to be saved, why just ask God to save you or just repeat the prayer or do this or do that. And he's turning from the doctrine that he used to teach that is sound Bible doctrine to a false doctrine. And they tell me all about this and how this man is against salvation by faith. And I just look at that and I say, well, that's, that's sad. That's sad because that's not what the Bible teaches. And he's gone so far, I, I believe he's what you call one of those um, lordship salvation type people. Uh, he, he calls salvation by faith easy believism. And he says, it's not by faith alone that you're saved. And, and, and all these things that he begins to say, and, and your ears just go, whoa. That is so not scriptural. And so I begin getting emails from people that used to be a part of his ministry. And they say, Brother Breaker, we used to watch him. We don't watch him anymore because we always doubted if we were saved or not based upon what he preached for salvation. Then we saw the true gospel. We trusted the blood for, of Christ. Now we don't doubt. And I say, praise God that you don't doubt. But they say, would you please mention that man? Would you please talk about him? Would you please expose him for who he is? And I go, no, no. I'm not going to deal with the man. I'm going to deal with the issue. The issue is, this fella, whoever he is, God bless him, says that faith alone is not enough to be saved. That you're not saved by faith. Is that biblical? Or is that falling away from the truth? Well, let's look at some scriptures. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. This fella is teaching that it's not enough to just believe. He is taking and, and telling people you have to repent to be saved. And you say, oh, okay, well what does repent mean? Because we look up the definition of repentance. We look at repentance. Repentance isn't a work in the Bible in the sense of salvation. Repentance is a change of mind. To be saved, you have to have a change of mind. You have to have an understanding <laughs> That, hey, it's not what I do. Oh, I trust what Jesus did. You, re you repent. You, you change direction from trusting in your righteousness to trusting Christ's righteousness. To trusting what you do and the prayer you said to trusting solely upon the blood Jesus shed. To trusting what man told you to trusting what God says. And the Bible says it's by faith that you're saved. You see, many people will say a sinner's prayer with their mouth, but there's no faith from the heart. They're not trusting in the blood of Christ when they repeat that prayer. They're lost. And this fella is propagating that teaching, and he's continually helping people to have no assurance of salvation. And so, what do they do? Well, just say the prayer over again. Just say, why don't you take them to the blood? You see, when you trust the blood... The work of righteousness is what? Peace forever. Salvation is a full understanding. And you're fully assured, I'm washed in the blood when I trust the blood. It's through faith that I'm saved. Romans 1.16, what does it say? Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So we're saved by faith. Even verse 17, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. It's faith that saves. Romans 3.22, How anybody can come out and say, It's not faith. You're not saved by faith. 
That's easy believism. <laughs> and attack the Bible teaching of faith for salvation, I cannot understand. And yet, by doing that, they're strengthening the false gospel, and the people that follow them continually think, I don't know if I'm saved or not, I don't have assurance. You see how they're helping those poor people to be lost? It's sad. And some of them have gotten saved and contacted me and said, Thank you so much for teaching the truth. I'm no longer lost. I've watched your videos and I've seen the gospel and I'm saved. I, I've got over there a stack of testimonies of people that say I got saved watching your videos. I debated on whether or not to read that today, but I said oh, I just don't have time. Romans 3.22 Even the righteousness of God, which is a faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe... For there is no difference. Verse 28, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. How are we saved today? By faith. It's not works. It's not what we do. It's by believing in what Jesus did. Faith is believing and is trusting. So it's by believing. What is Romans? I have here Romans 51.1. <laughs> Probably wrote that wrong. Romans 5.11. What does Romans 5.11 say? And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. You have to receive the atonement. How do you receive the atonement? Why, Galatians chapter 3, verse 22 tells us. Galatians 3, 22 is Paul writing, and he tells us that it's through faith that you receive something. Galatians 3, 22 says, But the Scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Alright, so faith and believing are the same thing. Now look at verse 24. Whereof the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Uh, Ephesians 3.17 That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love. So by faith we receive Jesus into our hearts. Yet this modern newfangled gospel that isn't even a gospel at all, of oh you want Jesus to come into your heart, ask him to come into your heart, that's not in the Bible. You can ask God to save you or ask God into your heart, but if you do so without faith in the gospel, the blood of Christ, you're still lost. And there are many within Christianity today that are like that. Many today who are trusting in what they did, and they've never trusted by faith in what Jesus Christ did for them. Yeah, back to Galatians 2.22, it says that the promise by faith might be given to them that believe. So by believing, we receive something. So we're not saved by works, we're saved by faith. After you're saved by faith, then you should have assurance. You should know you're saved. This 1, 2, 3, repeat after me, doesn't offer knowing you're saved. Oftentimes the people that do that without believing... They do so, and they always say, well, I don't know if I'm saved or not. And rather than taking people to the gospel to be saved, false ministers say, well, just say the prayer all over again. Well, wait a minute. If it didn't save the first time, why would you expect it to save the second, or the third, or the fourth? That's a false gospel. Salvation, according to the Bible, is by faith. I like to call it a no-so salvation. When you're saved, you know it. You know, salvation is like two different things in the Bible. Salvation is like being born, because when you're saved, you're born again. And salvation is like being married, your spouse to Christ. Now, I've never met anyone that told me, well, I don't know if I'm born or not. <laughs> I mean, I guess I was, because I'm here, but I always doubt. I, I just don't know when I was... No, when you're born, you know you've been born. You know you, you exist, therefore you've been born. No one never ever doubts if they were born or not if they're alive. So, how come when it comes to salvation, which is being born again, preachers preach things like, well, it's okay to doubt. Okay, so it's okay to doubt that you were born in the first place? See how they don't... Marriage. When you're, when you're married, you don't doubt whether you're married or not, if your wife is right there with you, and you took the vows, and you have the paper, and all that. Why, well, you know you're, you're married. How can you doubt it? Salvation is not something you're supposed to doubt. It's something you know. How do we know if we're saved? 1 John 5.13 says, These things have I written unto you, but believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. You can know you're saved. 
If you don't know you're saved, you have no assurance of salvation, most likely, I'm not saying that this is for every case, you know, like I said earlier, someone could be saved and have, have some doubt because of some sin in their life, but then quickly that'll go over, that'll be passed. You don't, you don't live continually in doubt as a Christian. You do know you're saved. But if you are doubting if you're saved or not, and you don't know for sure, could it be because you're lost? When you're saved, you know. How do you know you're saved? Well, the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. He says here in 1 John 5, 13, these things are written that you may know. So it's the Word of God that tells us if you're saved or not. Not the Word of man. So the way to know that you're saved is to go to the Scriptures. What does 2 Timothy 3.15 say? You see, I get so, so sad when I see people, and you come upon them and you say, Hey man, you're a Christian? You claim to be a Christian? Tell me how you got saved. They say, Oh, when I was five years old, I repeated the prayer. And you say, Yeah, but um, can you show me that in the Bible? Oh, and I don't have to. I'm saved. I, and my mommy said I was. And you say, Yeah, but... Have you ever, you know, doubted it? Oh, every night. So I just say the prayer over and over. And you say, well, can you show me that in the Bible? No, no, but it doesn't matter. My pastor told me that's how I'm saved. So he assured me that I'm saved because I did it. You're trusting in man. The Bible says we're supposed to trust in the Word of God. Can you imagine dying and going to hell? And then going before God at the judgment? And then trying to tell God, God, I don't know why you put me in hell. That pastor told me this and I did what he said. I know I'm saved because he said so. <laughs> Could you imagine that? And God just kind of goes, nope. I told you that the way to heaven and to have peace and assurance forever was through the blood of the cross. Trust the blood by faith, by believing, by trusting in what I did. And you were supposed to follow what I wrote. What I said, not what some man says. See, the problem with some preachers today, they want to be higher than God. Wasn't that the sin of Satan? Didn't he say, I will ascend? Didn't Satan want his word to be more important than the word of God? See, the Bible tells us it's through faith that we're saved. And it tells us what our faith should be in. But first, where do we go to find that information? Well, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, verse 14 says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of. Who was the one doing the assuring? The scriptures. Paul giving them the scriptures. And it says, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Who did they learn them from? The apostle Paul. The scriptures. Verse 15, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise into salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So we're saved by the word of God. Faith comes from hearing, hearing by the word of God. The word of God tells us that salvation is by faith. And faith in what? Faith in the blood. Romans 3.25 Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood. So salvation is by faith. If anybody ever tells you otherwise, they are a liar and a deceiver. And they are trying to give you a false sense of assurance. They're giving you a false plan of salvation. Galatians 3.14, what does it say? Galatians 3.14 says that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Well, that means that when we trust, when we believe, when our faith is the thing God says, that's when we receive salvation. We receive something by faith. This fellow I was telling you about earlier, he attacked me on YouTube. Say, oh, this guy, he teaches that you can steal salvation from God. <laughs> because he says, you go to salvation, you just take it. You just receive it. And I looked at that and I said, you know, that's not even worthy of responding to. The Bible says over and over and over in Romans chapter 5 that salvation is a free gift that you receive by faith. If I give you a gift and you take that from me, that gift, the last thing I'm going to do is say, you thief, you stole that from me. You can't steal a gift. If someone gives you a gift then, and you receive it, that's not stealing. That just shows you the mindset of the man. His mindset is not Bible. His mindset is, ah, uh, what I say. 
Well, what you say is not what the Bible says. And a lot of people have emailed me and said they were deceived by you, mister. And you were giving them a false gospel. And they said they've gotten saved, and I praise God for it. And they all say the same thing. And I've never doubted if I was saved or not since. You see, the blood gets rid of all doubt. We are saved by faith. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Uh, Acts 16, 30. What must I do to be saved? He says, verse 31, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation is by faith, by believing or by trusting. Ephesians 1, 13 says, You trust in whom you also trusted. The gospel of your salvation. Salvation is by trusting the gospel. What is the gospel? The death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. How he did it. Why he did it. Why did Jesus die? To shed his blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. One of these uh, people on YouTube, they follow this man of whom I'm speaking. And they recently came out and made a video entitled, The Blood of Jesus Christ is Not Necessary for Salvation. And I look at that, I just want to cry. What is that person doing? They're attacking the true biblical doctrine of salvation by faith in the blood. And I don't know for sure, so I can't say for sure, but I would almost bet on it <laughs> that they're doing that just to hold on to their little testimony of, and I said the prayer, so that's when I got saved. So they're wanting to hold on to their false profession of faith. And because of that, they attack the true doctrine of salvation. It's so that they don't have to admit, you know what, I'm probably not saved. And rather than me admit that I'm lost, I would rather kick against the pricks. I would rather preach against this gospel because I want so much to hold on to my own self-righteousness. You know what a person like that needs to do? They need to repent. They need to change their mind and realize, I can't come to God in my own. I must come by faith, trusting in what He's done. 1 Timothy 2, 3 through 7. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse uh, 3 through 7. Look what it says here. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Verse 4, who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. You see, there's a knowledge that you have to have, and it's the truth. And the knowledge of the truth is that salvation is by faith in what Jesus did, not what you do. And to be saved, you've got to come to that saving knowledge of the truth. And then it says there in verse 5, For there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ, I lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. The apostle Paul says, look, I preach the knowledge of the truth. I preach salvation. What is the knowledge of the truth? It's that you're saved by trusting the gospel. The gospel must be true, preached. And these people that will go to you and tell you, if you'll just, many of them go to Romans 10.13, and they take Romans 10.13 completely out of context, and they say, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, and they say, and that means, and this is where they change the scripture, that means you go to God and ask Him to save you. No, it doesn't. It does not say ask. Nowhere in that passage does it say, ask God. Matter of fact, there's no verse of Scripture in the Bible that tells us to ask God to save us in the church age, and then we're saved by asking. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, you ask God to come in your heart, and He'll come in. These are people that are inventing their own teachings, their own doctrines, and they want to hold on to their own profession of faith, and their own twisting of Scripture, and they want so bad to think that they're right, that they preach against the truth of salvation. What does it mean to call upon the name of the Lord? We have to look at the companion passages. 2 Timothy 2, 22, I believe it is. They that call upon the Lord of a pure heart. You look at the chapter 10 of, of Romans, and what does it say? The righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. If calling is speaking, then it's speaking from the heart. And it's by faith in the gospel. And when your faith is in the thing God said to put your faith in, that calls out to God, and God says, all right, that's a saved man because he's trusted in what I said, what the Word of God says to trust in. But if all you've ever done is come to God and say, oh, God, save me, and you're not trusting by faith, you're still lost. I'm not going to say that fellow's lost or not. I don't know. But I do know one thing. There's something wrong with someone that preaches against faith when the Bible tells us that it's faith that saves. Something terribly wrong with a person like that. 
Romans 15, 20, what does the Apostle Paul says? say? Yea, so I have strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. But as it is written, to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see, and they that have not heard shall understand. The gospel must be preached, heard, and understood. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Have you ever heard the gospel? All too often today in modern <clears throat> Christianity, there are people that go around, it's like they ignore the gospel completely, and they say, whatever you do, don't mention that. No, don't mention the blood. It's not essential. Don't talk about the blood. No, 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 no. Just tell somebody, repeat this prayer after me. What you've produced is a person who's trusting in something they did, and they will always lack assurance of salvation. The only way to get that person assurance is to take them to the blood atonement of Christ, to take them to the gospel. When a person understands that, and then by faith believes in that, that's when they get saved. So that's what I've done today. I've tried to give you the gospel. It's 1 Corinthians 15. It's how that Christ died. How did he die? He had to shed his blood. Yes, the blood of Christ is essential for salvation. Now, I've gone long. I'm sorry. I just want to get this out there. 1 Thessalonians 2. And I want to get this out here before the rapture, because I want people to get saved. <laughs> if you're left behind at the rapture, you better take a long look at yourself, because you're going to find out you were probably trusting in something you did, and that's why you were left behind. You're not trusting by faith in what Jesus did. Boy, is it going to be hard, because the rapture, when it comes, things will be different. Things will be way different when the rapture comes. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. Let me tell you how Paul speaks. Let me show you what Paul, the apostle, says. You see, Paul never went anywhere and told people, now just repeat this prayer after me and you'll go to heaven. That was never the gospel that Paul gave. Paul went and told people, it's all about Christ crucified. Look at him on the cross. Look at his blood. Look at the atonement. Receive the atonement. Believe by faith in what Jesus did. Trust the blood. Faith in the blood. That's why when we read 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 13, we read these words. 1 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 13 says, For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in, in unto you, that it was not in vain. But even after we had suffered before and were treated shame, shamefully and treated, as you know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. Apostle Paul says, Whenever we preach the gospel, there's always going to be contention. And those contentious people on YouTube, while well, they're trying to stir up contention, but what for? To give you assurance, or are they trying to give you the false gospel, which never gives assurance of salvation? He says, the gospel of God, which must contention. About Paul, for Paul, it's all about bringing the gospel, preaching the gospel. Verse 3, for our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor of guile. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. My desire isn't to please men. My desire is to preach the gospel. Say what it says. Verse 5, For neither at any time use we flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness. God is witness. God is watching. God is witness. Paul is saying, God is witness that I preached this gospel to you. That I preached salvation through faith in the gospel. Not a bloodless gospel like many preach today. Verse 6, Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse, nurse cherisheth, cherisheth it her children. Apostle Paul says, A true Christian, a true preacher of the gospel, is someone who is gentle. Not angry, mean-spirited, hateful, attacking, name-calling, putting down. No, no. Someone who cares about people enough that he's willing to stand up and tell the truth and say, now that person is telling a lie. Come to the truth. That's what Paul was like. So being affectionately desirous of you, verse 8, we were willing to have imparted unto you not, all, not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls because you were dear unto us. You see, a true gospel minister loves people. That's why he tells them the truth. See, I don't hate people. I don't make videos such and such exposed. I can't make videos where I'm mean and hateful and attacking other people. I've never wanted to do that. All I've wanted to do is from the heart give you the gospel because I love you and I want to see you get saved if you're lost. I want you to have assurance of salvation if you don't already. 
Verse 9, For you remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God. Verse 10, Ye are witnesses in God also how holy and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As ye know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children. And ye would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. Now verse 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. You see, it's the Word of God that works in your heart. We are saved by faith. Faith in what? Faith in the Word of God. Faith in what God says, not what man says. Faith coming by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Romans 10, 17. I have given you what the Word of God says. I've showed you the seven places in the Bible that the word assurance shows up. You know, it's amazing. Be assured you're going to die someday. But if you come to the work of righteousness, which is Christ on the cross, why, well, you'll have peace and assurance forever. Be assured that God will judge you someday. Also be assured that Jesus rose. What you need is a full assurance of understanding. If you tell me, well, I think I'm saved, but I'm not assured of it, I don't have much assurance, then maybe you don't understand. Maybe you need to understand in order to come to this truth and be saved. The gospel gives us much assurance. We have a full assurance of hope of the rapture coming. And we have a full assurance that salvation is by faith from the heart. I'm going to close with Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 through 23. I'm sorry I went long, but this is important. Your eternal soul, your internal destiny depends upon this. Are you saved? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 through 23. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. I am bold in my preaching because I can be. I don't sit around and go, well, I think this is the gospel, so I'm, I'm going to throw it out there and I just, mm, I hope I'm right. No, I have assurance. I am assured by God in His Word that when I preach this for salvation, I am preaching the true gospel and the true doctrine and the two, true way to be saved. So I can come boldly with the truth. And I can enter boldly into heaven only through the blood of Jesus. I'm not going to get to heaven and say, God, you better let me in because I did this and I did that and I did this and I demand heaven because of what I did. <laughs> no, no. I come to God and say, God, I come boldly through the blood because you said that's the thing that forgives our sins. And that's the thing that allows us to enter into the holiest, into heaven, the blood of Christ. Verse 20, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. 21, and having a high priest over the house of God. Verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. How are we to draw near to God in full assurance of faith? I can't for the life of me understand how there are men on YouTube making videos in which they say that salvation is not by faith. And they try to deceive you into thinking that they are King James Bible believers. I don't understand that. Because that is not what my King James Bible says. The King James Bible says we are to come to God through faith. And when our faith is in what God said to put the faith in, Romans 3.25, the blood, well then we have full assurance of salvation. We know that we're saved. Again, I wish I could read you all the emails that I get from people. Many of those emails go like this. Well, Brother Breaker, I used to watch so-and-so on YouTube. He had me so deceived and fouled up and confused because I was thinking it was something that I did or I said with my mouth that saved me. And I continually doubted my salvation. And every night before bed, I'd get down and I'd just cry out to God, Oh, God, I don't want to go to hell. Please save me. And every single night, they do that prayer over and over. They said, Brother Breaker, I can't tell you how glad I am that you told me the gospel. Because I understood that it's through faith in the blood of Christ. And when I trusted in what Jesus did for me, this is what they say. I knew I was saved. And I've never doubted it once. Why? Because they got saved. 
And this other fella, he's damning souls to hell. With a false, perverted lordship salvation. A, a, a do this, do that, repentance gospel. A, oh, you got to repeat this and ask it. And, and what's even worse is the man's testimony. <laughs> you ask him how he got saved. Well, when I was eight years old, I, I repeated this prayer and I said the sinner's prayer. And that's when I got saved. And you go, oh, oh, well, where's that in the Bible? And then yet later he comes out with another video going, I didn't get saved then when I was 20-something. You know what I did? I repeated the sinner's prayer over again. If it didn't save you the first time, why would I think it'd save you the second time? What's the difference? Well, according to him, he repented. He quit sinning. He did this. He did that. Oh, so his, 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 his repentance, his works are what saved him. I guess he helped God save him. No, it doesn't work that way. You're either saved by faith, by receiving the free gift by faith, or you're saved by what you do. If you're trusting in what you do, you will always have a lack of assurance because you'll always wonder, did I do enough? That's the works gospel. But the gospel of salvation by grace through faith is Jesus did it all. He did enough. And when I trust what he did, then I know I'm saved. So are you saved? I sure hope you get saved. The rapture's coming soon, I believe. If you're left behind, it'll be too late. I want to see you saved. Jesus saves. Thank you for watching. Amen.